This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott, and I'm here to read you a scary bedtime story. Welcome, a big warm welcome to my new listeners. I hope you like what you hear and stick around. So, this week, I wrote you a story. I know, I know. A guided nightmare and an original story all in one week? Do I have a fever? Actually, yes. I literally do. Last I checked, it was at a laughable 100.2, not high enough to stop me from putting out this episode. It being almost three in the morning is also not going to stop me. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, this is a Shelby Scott original called Bug Out. Welcome to Bug Out, where we surprise 10 average Americans in the middle of the night and tell them it is time to bug out. They grab their gear and we drop them at different points of the Novakova Forest on Newell Island, where they compete to outlast each other for 90 days in the untamed wilderness for a grand prize of $100,000. So do you have what it takes to bug out? Well, hello, internet people. My name is Stephanie. I am currently a little drunk and a lot high, and I have finally decided to tell my story. Best case scenario, you'll all think I'm crazy or an outright liar, making shit up for phony internet points. Worst case is, I don't know, I'll be sued out my ass or taken out by the CIA or some shit. Either way, holding on to this is not worth my sanity anymore. Not that I have much of that left. Here I sit in the dark living room of my dirty apartment with a glowing rectangle of my laptop in front of me, ready to blow up my whole life. Am I doing this to raise awareness to my fellow man about the crazy shit that goes on around us? The things they don't want us to know about. You know, them, the men in black, the Illuminati, that furniture website who secretly sells kids, the people who are really in charge, the ones that know things, that keep things from the rest of us, lest we go completely nuts. You know, they do think that there was a whole advanced civilization, whole civilizations before the ancient Sumerians who had full-blown computers and electricity and that maybe, just maybe, they flew a little too close to the sun and stumbled on some knowledge that scared them so much that they abandoned all that shit and went back to farming and inventing the written language all over again. Maybe they really are protecting us. Or maybe they don't want us to find our way out from under the proverbial boot and become a happy utopian society, and I'm going to risk my life telling you all a teeny tiny piece of those secrets they're keeping. Or I just got fired from another shit job, and my dating life is fucked but not literally, which is the problem, and I want to share this awful burden because misery loves company. Either way, keep scrolling, my friend. I need to tell you about David. But first, some background, so this whole batshit story makes more sense. 
So, about seven years ago, I was living in LA as the personal assistant to a mid-level producer. He had produced some big TV shows in the 90s, but it had been years since he had done anything really relevant. And that's how he got talked into producing this dumb shit reality show. Through the sticky spider web we call networking, he had been introduced to this husband and wife who pitched the idea of this show to him. Oh my god, they were so fucking weird. But I can't get sidetracked, just know that they gave off major are they siblings or dating vibes. So the show. The show is about surviving in the wilderness. Of course, this has been done before. I could name tens of shows like this already on air, but I don't want to get double sued for, I don't know, libel somehow. Of course, every show needs a twist to set it apart from its almost indistinguishable competition. So this show's twist was... They wanted to find people who were only sort of into doomsday prepping and survivalism. They didn't want people who actually knew how to do very well in the wilderness. They wanted the people who would make hilarious and frustrating TV for viewers to tune in every week. Bumbling idiots trying to start fires with flints they had no idea how to use, trying to pitch their cheap sporting good section tents in the rain and hunting for squirrels with overpowered assault rifles. They basically proposed, what if just some average Joe had to survive an apocalypse? Someone the audience could laugh at and maybe even empathize with. As good as like some guy named Thor could identify every type of mushroom known to man and could field dress anything with a pulse while building a fully functional and heated shelter out of river clay and sticks was at surviving, the audience can't, like, see themselves in Thor. They can't laugh at Thor. Thor is better than them. So, born was this idea of just some guy survival TV. The antithesis to the uber serious blue filtered survival shows those other channels were making. That wasn't enough for my boss though. He wanted one more edge and he's the one who came up with the idea of kidnapping the contestants. His reasoning was that he wanted it to feel like a real emergency. Like if you were really woken up one day and had to leave the house in a hurry and whatever you grabbed was all you could use to survive. There was some arguing over the liability of actually kidnapping people, even if they had signed up for it. So they compromised and instead decided they would let the contestants know they had been chosen, but they weren't told when they would actually be starting their 90 days. Then, one night, they would be woken up with lights and sirens and screaming military-esque actors who would tell them to go, 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 and they were expected to grab their bug out bags and whatever else they could carry on their backs and get into a van where they would be taken to their drop-off point. Well, they actually spent a few days in a hotel while they waited for the other contestants' kidnapping segments to be filmed. There was no budget for us to send camera crews to 10 different locations on the same night. But still, they were pretty heavily monitored and their bags were confiscated during their hotel stay, so they couldn't add anything to them before going out into the boonies. So apart from all that, this was all taking place on an island off the coast of British Columbia. Even though the contestants were given their own cameras to document the bulk of the show, we still had a full camera crew booked for the initial send-off and the finale. But in between, it was just going to be a lot of waiting around for people to tap out one at a time. For big chunks, there was nothing to film but the health checks every two weeks to make sure the remaining contestants were still of sound-ish body and mind. Other than that, we were relying on the footage from the contestants themselves. So, for most of the season, we had a skeleton crew of 
Two camera guys, a sound guy, one actual survivalist, and one wilderness EMT, and a local ranger spot. That was filled by a few different rangers who worked in revolving shifts. Oh, and a producer. That's where I come in. See, my producer knew he wanted eyes on the whole production, but he didn't want to be out in the frozen wilderness for three months. Even if we were staying in a couple cozy cabins and not in flimsy tents on the ground, it still wasn't the Ritz. Neither did his fellow couple producers. Like, I cannot express how shit this production was, how cheap, how many corners were cut. Anyway, back to the point. So yeah, my boss wanted eyes that he could trust on the whole thing. But he didn't want to spend any extra money. So, he negotiated with me. Stephanie, he said, if you go for your regular salary I already pay you, I will give you a producer credit. I'd like to say I hesitated, but that would be a lie. I jumped on that producer credit so fast. It was like a golden ticket. If I did a good enough job, then my boss would give me more producing opportunities, and those credits could get me out from under him, and I could become a producer all on my own. I had fucking stars in my eyes, you guys. I was planning what I'd be wearing to the Oscars in five years, for Christ's sake. All I could see was the life I had worked so hard for finally coming true. I had no idea what would end up happening would destroy so many lives and leave me in an unending existential crisis, drunkenly ranting on internet forums like those loons who claim to get abducted by aliens. (sighs) The first two weeks was a blur. To be honest, I don't even remember what David's kidnapping segment was like. Yeah, we're back to David now. I do remember one guy freaked out and dumped his entire silverware drawer in his bug-out bag, but didn't remember to grab his hunting rifle. He went home pretty quick. I never saw his footage, but I imagine it would have been hilarious watching him dump all those forks and butter knives out, trying to figure out how to justify bringing them to the camera. The audience would have loved it. Oh, and another guy tried to bring his dog His argument was that we said, whatever you can carry, and he could technically carry his dog. Like, yeah, you got us there, sir, but we aren't flying your shivering greyhound to an island that is about to be an average high of 44 degrees Fahrenheit. That took, like, so much convincing. I was in full producer mode. I ended up just giving him an ultimatum to leave the pooch or don't do the show and he wasn't about to give up his 15 minutes. So, the dog stayed. (sighs) David. The only odd thing I know he grabbed was a framed photo of his family. Him and his wife and two kids. But the only reason I know that is... uh, We'll get to that. Okay. I know how the internet is. I'm actually sobering up a bit now. I know you're here for the spooky part. So, I'll get to it, you animals. So we were about 32 days in. The crew was all split between two cabins. It was mostly just boring. Like I said, the only time we really did anything was every two weeks. So by then, we had done two checks. The first one was uneventful, but the second, one woman, Cheryl, I think her name was, went home. Cheryl broke down just at the sight of us. She grabbed onto our EMT Alex's jacket and howled, take me home, take me home, just sobbing, like wailing, sobbing. I've never seen someone so distressed. We got her back to our camp, 
got her warm, pumped her full of electrolytes and food. Then we sat her down for her exit interview. All within a few hours. Time is money, you know. By then, she had pulled herself together. She said it was a rewarding experience, but she was in over her head, and she turned that into some long rant about how she had more respect now for our troops and how kids these days need to watch this show so they could too have more respect for the troops. Yeah, it didn't make sense to me either, but the lady had been living on squirrel meat and seaweed for like two weeks. But, and this is something I didn't remember till way later, I'm talking years later, it's not like I forgot but I hadn't ever connected the dots. Shit, maybe I still haven't. Anyway, Cheryl and I were standing near the clearing where the helicopter would land to take her back to the mainland. She would go home for now and we'd bring her back for the big finale. I had pulled out a little handheld camera that I had brought along. I thought it would be a fun surprise when we started editing to show I got some extra, more raw-looking footage. I thought it would score me good producer points for my boss and his colleagues. Looking back, it was kind of a stupid idea. But at the time, I felt like a cinematic genius. The rest of the crew had gone back inside the cabins. So I took my chance to do a little mini-interview with Cheryl. Um, look, I'm not going to transcribe it, but you can click on this link. I'll post what I have. Sorry about the terrible video quality. Something happened to all my tapes and fucked with the video. The audio is still pretty good, though. This is Cheryl about to board the helicopter to go home. Cheryl, I know you already did your exit interview, but if you forgot anything or have anything more to say, feel free to tell me now. Is this... What is this? Is this going to be used for the show? Um, maybe? This is just a little side project I'm doing. I need you to be honest with me. Did you send someone out there? Out where? To the forest? There was something out there that last night. You sent someone out there to scare me so I would lose. Oh, no, no, no. We didn't... we didn't send anyone. The only people who are even here are me and Mike Tell me and... now. You sent someone out there. There was something out there stalking around. It felt like a dream. No, we didn't. We know the wilderness is tough enough. We didn't send anyone to scare you. I know how this reality TV works. It isn't a secret these days. We all know you manipulate things. I just don't appreciate what you did. You made me look foolish. Cheryl, I, I swear we didn't send anyone. You said it felt like a dream. Maybe it was just a nightmare. Are you stupid? I said it felt like a dream. I didn't say it was a dream. I can't explain it. There was something out there. The shadows were different. The shadows? There's the helicopter now. Look, Cheryl, I promise. Why don't I book you a day at the hotel spa? On us. Cheryl? I tried to track down Cheryl last year to ask her more about what she saw to maybe get some more answers. But... Her family informed me that she had passed away. Soon after she got back home from the show, Cheryl's doctor discovered an aggressive type of thyroid cancer that developed abnormally quickly, and four months later, she was gone. Now, yes, we can officially get back to David. Like I said, it was about 32 days in. We were all bored out of our minds. It was me... Our sound guy, Frank, the camera people, Terry and Andreas, EMT Alex, survivalist Rick, and that night the ranger on duty was Ranger Rhodes, 
Rhodes was outside doing some general maintenance to one of the cabins. I can't remember what. I just remember passing them outside and they were carrying a ladder and mumbling about getting something fixed before the first big snow. It was early November and the really cold season was creeping up fast. I was inside teaching Alex how to play blackjack. Frank was in the corner fiddling with some of his sound equipment and Terry and Andreas and Rick were in the other cabin, just passing the time in some way, same as the rest of us. With a waning amount of sunlight and lack of activities, some of us sort of had our nights and days mixed up. Alex and I had become night owls, taking on the unofficial night shift, listening for the satellite phone to possibly go off with someone wanting to tap out. Whenever we had contestants tap out, we basically told them to wait until morning for safety's sake, where we would board into a helicopter sent from the mainland and go pick them up in a clearing, usually near the beach since the forest was so thick. All of them stayed pretty close to the beach anyway. They never minded waiting, only two so far had called out at night, and they were perfectly fine with spending one last night in the wilderness. It gave them a chance to sort of reflect to the cameras privately about why they had decided to leave and what the money would have meant to them, but their health was more important, and yada yada yada. This time was different, though. This time, David called. When it rang, I checked my watch, and for some reason, I remember the exact time. 1.11 a.m. Alex was the closest, so they answered. Alex barely got out the word base camp before I could hear an urgent voice on the other end. Alex was young, and this wasn't exactly their job, so they just started into the script they'd heard the rest of us use— Stay put till morning, then call us at daylight with your coordinates on the closest beach. But I could tell something was up. Something was different. The voice kept interrupting, and one distinct word I kept catching was, NOW. I took the phone from Alex, and thus began the worst night of my life. The beginning was basically this. David begging to be picked up now, telling us we had to come, and that something rushed him like it wanted to attack him. That he tried to wait until morning because he was also developing a terrible sunburn-like rash he had been concerned with, but he couldn't wait any longer because something was outside his tent. He said to bring guns. It was around then that I decided to grab my camcorder. Again, the video is fucked, but this link will take you to what happened that night. You can maybe follow along. I turned it off a couple times, so there are some time jumps. Look, just listen, okay? Okay, David, can you say that again for me? You have to come now. There's something here. The shadows. The shadows all feel backwards. Survivalist Rick, remember Rick? And the ranger will let us know if it's safe to come get you. David? David, are you still there? Just get here. No! Please! I'm going to die. You are not going to die. I won't let that happen. But I'm going to hang up now. I will call you right back. I have to go get everyone. Will you be okay for three minutes, five minutes tops? Just hurry. Okay, so we'll also just send out Terry and Frank. Can't all fit in the truck. One one camera should do it. Sounds good. Frank, you got all your gear ready? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Steph, you can hang back too. No, I'm going. I really think you should stay here dangerous as it is. I'm going. That's not even a question. And if you have a problem with that, we can talk in the morning about your continued employment with this oh, show. come on. Jesus crap. Are you filming this? This is a safety meeting. You're filming and you're threatening our jobs? That's fucking great. We have about 
about 10 more miles to go. Do you want to call him again? After we get there, we still have three miles to hike to his location. Yeah, I'll call him again. Are you here? Hey, David! No, we aren't quite there yet, but I wanted to give you an update. The ranger is saying that we have about 10 miles to drive and about three miles to hike. So it's going to be another hour or so, depending on what the terrain, what the terrain looks like when we get into the woods. But you're coming, right? <laughs> yeah, man, we're coming. Just calm down. Stay in your shelter and don't go outside until you know for sure that we're there. David, uh, what's the thing stalking you? a bear or a mountain lion or what, it would be helpful to know what we could be encountering when we get closer. I don't know. But there were more. Now they're gone. But I don't think that they're far. Sounds like wolves. Motherfucker. We might have to call in some backup. I called in my base already. They already know we're on our way out and they're on their way into our base camp. They'll be behind us as soon as they land. You hear that, David? Lots of help on the way. Just stay put, okay? And try to keep calm. You don't! Why do you even have that thing? It's pitch black. Stop picking jack shit. I don't know. I thought maybe we could see the audio. That's what Frank's here for. Terry, just do your fucking job, okay? And I'll do mine. Shut up, the both of you. We're getting closer. Steph, do something useful and get David back on the phone. We're almost there. Are you fucking kidding me? Steph, goddammit, just do it. Put down that stupid camera. Terry's right. You aren't picking up anything. You're going to twist an angle if you don't start paying more attention. Are you here? Hey, David. We're closing in on your campsite. We should be there in about 10 minutes. And just wanted to check on you one more time. I'll be in my tent. That motherfucker hung up on me. David! David? Hello? I checked his tent. There's no one here. Maybe he got spooked again and tried to hide in the woods. Let's get him back on the phone.
Yeah, um, Rick, you're near it. What does it look like? They're all wearing matching pajamas. The one where you're all wearing matching pajamas? No, I'm... Yes, but... I'm standing here, looking at that photo. You don't see me? I don't understand what's going on. Maybe he's sick and delusional. Bad water or fever can't do that to you. Let's spin out and see if we can find him. Please, I'm not delusional. I'm standing right here. But I can't see you. Um... Guys? Is that his sack phone? I think so. What the fuck? Before I left. Before they all left. I, I used the label maker to put their names on the back of their sat phone. Does it... It says David. Jesus Christ. <laughs> what? What happened? David, um... We found your sat phone. The one you're talking to me on right now. Our father, who are the seven... He's just praying now. I don't know what to do. What the fuck do we do? On Earth, as I'm, I'm calling the other contestants. What if he broke into one of their campsites and took their phone? We could be dealing with someone who is, has gone completely insane out here. Are you still filming? What the fuck, Steph? I'm reporting you to the Union when we get back. Oh, fuck off, Terry. Everyone who has a sat phone. Here's the sheet with the remaining contestants. Rhodes, you start with Charles and Bethany. I'll take Priya and Walter. Rick, take Jose and Doug. Steph, just keep David on the phone. David, we're going to make a few calls, okay? Just sit tight. Why don't you tell me... What are your kids' names? ...have been accounted for. So he hasn't gone to any other camps. They're back. Jesus, my lord and savior. Oh, I'm back in the tent. They're back. They're back and they saw me. They know where I am. David, calm down. We're right here. We're going to figure this out. Oh god, oh god, oh god. They're here. I don't know what they are. Dear readers, is where my camera's battery died. All our equipment died out there. All of it fully charged, even the unused backup camera batteries were dead. After that came a flurry of rescue teams. We pulled the rest of the contestants immediately and sent them home. We split the prize money among the remaining six and told them in the vaguest of terms that there had been an emergency and we were pulling the plug. There was a months-long search for David, until the island became coated in ice and snow, and was too treacherous to keep looking. In the spring, they tried for two more weeks, but nothing, not a trace was ever found. Oh, and I know you're all cracking those knuckles to go on a deep dive to find evidence of this show, and when you don't, you'll be back to call me a liar. But you don't know show business, baby. You especially don't know how evil some of these people are, how low they'll stoop. The family was given a fat settlement. How much? I don't know. Enough to shut them up. Plus... Due to the dangerous nature of the show, it wasn't out of the realm of possibility that something could have gone wrong. So I think they just sort of eventually accepted that their loving husband and father was just another victim of that untamed wilderness that he had willingly signed up for. All of the footage of the show was destroyed. 
so was all the promotional stuff that was already being mocked up. All that was saved was a test promo I had on a flash drive and my little camera. That was because no one had any idea I had it in the first place. At least, none of the people with lawyers breathing down their necks. The others never mentioned it to the producers. I sort of wonder if they wanted to save it too. The only evidence of what really happened that night. We were all forced to sign terrifying NDAs, and we even spoke to some feds. Seriously, by the time we got back to base camp the next morning to shower and rest while the other rescue team took over, there was a big black helicopter parked on the lawn, and several men in suits there to let us know it would be in our best interest to keep the entire affair to ourselves. (laughs) One of them even mentioned how undignified deathbed confessions were, like They wanted us to take this to the grave. After that, even though we all went our separate ways, I kept tabs on the crew who was with me out in the woods that night, through social media and mutual friends. Hollywood is actually a pretty small town, so it wasn't hard. Ranger Rhodes and Terry are both long gone, each of them having developed different forms of cancer shortly after we wrapped. I heard Frank is still kicking around town, working in sound still, but through the grapevine I heard that he's been in and out of jail and rehab for heroin. Rick, the survivalist, went off the grid a few years back. I have no idea where he is. No one seems to. He just walked into the woods one day, and poof, gone. Little Alex, my blackjack buddy. Alex is the hardest to talk about. One night, Alex wrote a letter, bought some rope, and decided to disappear in their own way. So there it is. I can practically feel the red sniper dot on my forehead. Because something is out there, in those woods. Why do you think so many people disappear every year with nary a fucking finger bone to ever be found? I don't know what all of it means. All I know is, I never want to end up where the shadows are backwards. Hey there, it's the new year. You've got mood boards and resolutions and work is back in full swing and you don't need any extra stress in your life. And Factors Ready to Eat Meal Delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more. Plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic lunch preps, and rush dinners. Factors 2-Minute Meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Need a special occasion meal? Gourmet Plus is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done 
easily. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change up your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Stress less over mealtimes in the new year. Factor's no prep, no mess meals free up time otherwise spent on shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook, they also help me stay on top of my goals. With offerings like Protein Plus and Keto, I can stay on track. This is definitely going to come in handy for my New Year's goals. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful, nutritious eats. In addition to ready-to-eat meals, they have cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times. Head to factormeals.com slash scareyoutosleep50 and use code scareyoutosleep50 to get 50% off. That's code scareyoutosleep50 at factormeals.com. As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life. And one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on. And something that has helped me tremendously is Rocket Money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Thanks for listening. Yes, I do have a fever. Yes, I do feel like garbage. Yes, I stayed up doing this for you. And yes, I'm probably not making 100% sense right now. And I'm going to listen back to this someday and be like, girl, you should have just gone to sleep and done this the next day. But I promise, I promise that it would be out tonight. It's not even tonight anymore. It's 3 a.m. One of you said that you were getting off work at 6 a.m. and you were going to listen or going to work at 6 a.m. And I don't know what time zone you're in, but I I probably missed it. My head hurts. I had a bad week, you guys. Actually, you know what? No, it was very bad. Half the the electricity in my apartment is out. If you follow me on Twitter, on my personal Twitter, you'll have seen me whining all week about the tons of things that have gone awry in my life this week. And (laughs) to cap it all off, uh, it is Saturday. Oh, nope. It's Sunday morning. Actually, we did establish that it is almost 3 a.m. Um, I earlier tonight, this evening, I just like my throat was hurting. I wasn't feeling good, but you know, I, I, I don't know. It just sometimes when you do a lot of voice work, your throat hurts. It just happens. Um, just drinking my tea, took some vitamins and then around, I don't know, 9 p.m., I got the chills so bad. I haven't been sick with, like, a fever and chills in years. I really cannot remember the last time. So it's not a fun feeling. Um, The chills were so, so bad. And I forgot how fevers worked. So then I started getting hot because, you know, that's the fun thing about fevers is you're freezing and then you're hot and then you're freezing and then you're hot. And I was like, oh, isn't it like when you get hot, that means your fever's going down? So I went and took my temperature again and no, <laughs> it had gone up. It's 
it's fine. I, I haven't taken it in a few hours. It's fine. Um, okay. Follow the show. <laughs> what an introduction to all the new people who are joining us this evening. <laughs> um, if, if you don't know, why would you? Why would you know this? Acast, my wonderful host site, Acast. If you have a podcast, go with Acast. Um, they are putting out uh, an ad for my show on a lot of their shows, and it's great, and I'm very excited. It means it's drawing in a lot of people, and this is my introduction to them. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm usually not... You know, I was going to say I don't ramble this much. That's a lie. That's a lie. Anyway, go follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Scare You to Sleep. There's also a Reddit group. I don't know if there's anything in there. I don't check it because that's your place to go, to be anonymous. Um, speaking of Reddit, clearly this story was based on my love, and those who have been around for a while know that I love Reddit and Reddit mysteries and confessions. I also love ARGs. And I was going to make this more of an ARG and, like, pretend that it was real. But then I was like, maybe not. Because I just did a creepy pot. Oh, if you're not if you're not subscribed to Patreon, um, Patreon, I just came out with a narration of one of the most famous creepypastas, the Russian sleep experiment. I learned this week that a lot of people still think the Russian sleep experiment is is a true story. Just telling you here and now, it's not. It's a creepy pasta. I got a lot of messages and letters. Um, not like letter letters. No one hand wrote me a letter about this. Maybe. I, I don't know. I haven't checked my P.O. box in a little bit. But um, <laughs> I, I got a lot of messages and comments about the um, veracity of the Russian sleep experiment and how it wasn't possible because of science and i agree it's not that's it's not a true story and no one i don't think anyone ever tried to pass it off as one maybe they did in the beginning but now it's it's just a fake story and i explain i explain creepypastas on the patreon if you don't know what those are um so yeah join patreon for a dollar is the lowest tier and it's fun come hang out um what else this is a mess. This is not going well. I'm making a bad first impression. I need to just go to bed. All right, everybody. I already rambled for... Sometimes you guys get mad at me when I don't ramble long enough. I'm trying to ramble. I'm I am feverish. Okay, I love you. Um, go drink water. I fucking know that I'm going to drink a lot of water. I hope you like this story. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, let me know how you liked it, because... I, like, literally really, really loved writing this one. It was so much fun. Anyway, um, I love you. Go get some sleep. Sweet dreams. <laughs>